Hi there, and welcome to Military Histories, a podcast from York Army Museum. Each week we share an interview from the Royal Dragoon Guards audio archive. This season we will be sharing interviews with veterans of the Korean War. You can find more details about the Royal Dragoon Guards oral history project in the show notes. If you want to find out a bit more about our museum, there are links to our website and social media channels in the show notes too. In this week's interview you can hear Major Brian Clipston describing his army experiences. The first 20 minutes of this interview focus on Brian's time in Korea. Thanks for listening, future episodes will drop every Friday. My name is Owen Jude and today I am interviewing the former Major Brian Clipston of the 5th Inniskilling Dragoon Guards at his home in Brigstock, Northamptonshire. The date is Monday the 23rd of October 2013. Uh, before I joined the Army, I was an apprentice gas fitter at a company called the Thrapston Gas Light and Coke Company. Um, I did four years apprenticeship and at the end of that time I received my notice uh, to be called into the army. I had to report to Richmond in Yorkshire and I had no idea of what it was going to be like but I travelled up by train and when I got there there was chaos at the station. There was army trucks all over the place Military police saying, go here, go there, go everywhere. Anyway, I got into the back of a truck and found myself being taken to the 8th Royal Tank Regiments who uh, had a training role at Catrick at that time. Um, We were allocated a hut and taken to be given clothing. A lot of the people I was with who were also national servicemen, were looked dazed and shaken by their experience. And we were then given our kit, um, our boots and everything, and a rifle, and taken back to the hut, showed how to make our beds up, where you have to fold your blankets every morning and make a square pack at the end of the bed, We were given instructions about the routine that would take place, how we had to be out of the hut at a certain time in the mornings, and in that time the hut had to be cleaned, the toilets had to be cleaned. In fact, we were responsible for cleaning everything that we were using. We would then, in the first instance, be taken on uh, basic training, learning the various drills uh, that you need as a soldier. This is where I encountered my first um, knowledge of army discipline in that I dropped my rifle and found that evening myself running round the square with the rifle held above my head in the pouring rain. Um, That was for... (laughs) A misdemeanour. Anyway, we carried on until we passed out um, when we were considered uh, proficient in in the drill and we went on to trade training. How we were selected for trade training, I have no idea, but I was told that I was going to be a tank uh, radio operator and that's what I did. I then did um, training a in the trade until I uh, was proficient in that and then I was posted um, to the 5th Royal Tank Regiment in Germany. I was 18 years and I was getting a lot of experience there. This was a new experience for me and it was vastly different from the time I spent uh, as a gas fitter. In the 5th Royal Tank Regiment, um, which was based at Hona. Um, Hona is a large, um, a large camp where a single block would house a squadron of 60 men 
and, and I'd been told it had been used by Hitler for a lot of his armoured regiments um, during the war. It was also adjacent to the famous or infamous uh, Belsen concentration camp. I was put in a uh, sea squadron um, where I was put in SHQ troop and after a short time I, I liked it so much that I suppose I must have been um, what they were looking for because they decided once I'd signed on for five years and I'd changed um, to those five years from being a national serviceman of 18 months is because I found military life so interesting and it seemed fulfilling to me that I didn't really want to go back to civilian life. Also, the fact what another fact that influenced me was the fact that I had very little education. At the age of 11 years, I'd left school and went into hospital with peritonitis. Um, I was in that, that hospital for seven months. When I come out, uh, I had a year's convalescent. Then I went back into hospital again. And when I came out, there was no time to go back to school. You finished your education in those days at 14 years. And that was the reason that I signed on for another five years with the, with, with the army. Just at that time, um, well, before that, they sent me to Bobbington Camp on a wireless course. And to uh, go to on that course, you had to be an NCO. So they promoted me to Lance Corporal. And when I came back from the course, I found out that they were then asking for volunteers to join the 5th Royal Inner Skill in Dragoon Guards and go to Korea. Um, this interested me. Um, I thought, well, I'm a soldier. I will have a go uh, to travel the world and see what was happening in a war in Korea. And I then uh, volunteered and found myself being transferred over to the 5th Royal Inner Skill in Dragoon Guards, who at that time were training in Hona, the same camp as the 5th Royal Tank Regiment. After a short uh, lot of training with the 5th Royal Inner Skill in Dragoon Guards, where they were melding all the different people who'd come to them uh, from the various regiments, we left for, for Korea. Um, we sailed on the HMS Georgic, which uh, had been a, a luxury liner previously uh, and was quite, a, quite nice to uh, set sail in that. I'd heard so many tales about troop ships that uh, I didn't know what to expect, but the Georgic was, um, was good. Um, we dropped in on several places on the way to Pusan in Korea, uh, Aden, Colombo, Hong Kong and Singapore where we were allowed uh, one day's leave and you, you got your tattoos. We then landed at Pusan as I said and were taken by train um, which took a hell of a long time in fact, I, I think it was something like 36 hours, wooden seats to an area where um, we spent a night and it was under canvas, very, very cold. And that is the first um, indication of how cold it was going to be in Korea. Um, and an example of that, I woke up in the morning and the sleeping bag, we were sleeping on, on the floor on a, on a canvas sheet, but I woke up in the morning and there was ice where the condensation of my breath, had, uh, where I'd breathed onto the sleeping bag. 
once uh, we left this um, air, holding area, we were then sent to a different uh, locations in Korea where we were taken over the tanks from the 8th Hussars. B Squadron, the squadron that I was in, uh, was to be kept in reserve initially and we were then living in tents and bivouacs. This would change when we went to the front line, but at that time, living in a tent or a bivouac uh, in uh, December was, <laughs> was extremely arduous and uh, very, very cold. And we realised uh, that it was going to be a bit rough being in Korea. Well, the weather anyway. We stayed in reserve and in reserve we did maintenance and got ourselves ready and eventually we moved to the front line. My impressions of Korea uh, at that time was, of course, it was very, very cold. It was very, very, very rough country. All you could see was hills, um, where you could see anything sticking out of the snow in the way of scrub and that. Um, and I could see no tracks. After coming from Germany, you think, well, there's lovely autobahns, and here I can't see anything at all. How do we get about? It didn't look to me like tank country. We were moved into our forward positions, and in Korea the forward positions were a hole dug at the top of the hill in which the tank was dropped, and, and well, dropped is the incorrect word, where the tank drove, and you just had the turret showing. With, with enough room to swing the gun round. Um, the top of these hills, when the snow went, you could see, were completely bare, where they'd been battered by people walking, tanks moving, and the shells from their enemy, from the enemy. It was a static war for me. We looked across the valley, and you could see the uh, Korean-Chinese positions and uh, obviously they could see us. Um, the work there consisted of watching. We watched the enemy positions by day, and we gave support to the infantry um, when they went forward with their fighting patrols against the enemy. Um, we very very close association with some infantry regiments and they they used us quite a bit to bring fire down on enemy positions or anything which they uh, wanted destroyed the living conditions on those hills and i mentioned previously we'd been in bivouacs and tents was a bunker a basher as we called them dug in the side of the hill um, to make a square room with logs on top, earth thrown on top of that. Um, where we slept inside there, we got um, picket stakes that were used normally to support barbed wire, drove them into the wall and interlaced them with the telephone wire and on those beds we placed our sleeping bags. The heating of those uh, bashers, bunkers, was done by a homemade space eater, which consisted of a uh, ammunition case or ammunition box with the 20 pound of shells, which were the Centurion ammunition, bottom sawn off, and all fitted together to make a chimney. Into that ammunition box was a drip feed of petrol, which um, kept these bashers very, very warm, as the chimney and everything would get red out, but very, very dangerous, with petrol just dripping into um, uh, <laughs> an ammunition box that was red hot but it was the only 
um, source of heating we'd got and I think the infantry were very envious of us and I think the tank crews when they were watching the infantry coming back with their wood which had gathered for the fires um, felt a bit superior that they'd got a fire and the um, infantry had to make theirs with wood. The, I'd gone to Korea as a Lance Corporal and I was posted again to SHQ Troop where I was the second in command's radio operator. Uh, we were in reserve and suddenly I was uh, sent before the um, squadron leader he was an acting squadron leader at the time and he told me that well he asked me first where I'd been that before previously um, I had left the camp just to wander and look round really with another person and and while we were away something must have happened because the whole squadron was checked to see who was missing and there was myself and another man missing uh, we were put in front of the uh, colonel of the regiment who demoted us and I became a trooper um, as additional punishment to that I suppose they thought they sent me then to second troop which was in the line um, where once again I was a, a, a radio operator for them um, two things uh, stand out, or three things really stand out to me from my time in Korea, where I was taken away from normal duties of watching for the enemy. And the, the first one was they sent the troop I was in to the shores of the Imjim River to fire at rafts that were being sent down the river in attempt to smash the baileys bridges and the supports of any other bridges um, on the engine. The engine was in full flow or in spate, it was flooded and the current was very strong. But one thing uh, I saw when I was on watch one day, watching for these rafts to see if there were any coming down, was the sight of these swollen bodies, real bloated, and it was that has stuck with me for the rest of my life, the sight of those bodies. Um, shortly afterwards we were told to stop firing at the rafts as our uh, shells were ricocheting off the rafts and going into areas where I think there were friendly troops. The second thing was, that sticks in my mind from Korea, was when the troop I was in were trying to get forward into another position to uh, fire at the enemy and observe the enemy. During that time, it was very, very icy. We had great difficulty in climbing the hills and getting into position. When we got into the hill, hit the into the top of the hills, uh, the tank commander said we would manoeuvre into position. He got down and I got down as well. He was guiding the tank backwards when suddenly it slipped and disappeared down the side of this hill, dropping about 100 feet and rolling over it two or three times. We thought that the crew, there were two people still in there, would uh, be dead. But we went to the edge there and saw where this huge swathe of trees had been knocked to one side as the tank went down, um, yelled, and we got the answer from two vo voices. They were, in fact, unhurt. And after that, we we returned to the squadron um, and we were called the 38,000 pound troop as that's what it cost to replace a Centurion tank. Um, the Royal Engineers the following day 
blew that tank up. They filled it with explosives, I'm told, and blew the turret off. That was um, two of the things I'd bring back that's in my mind from being in Korea. The third one was the death of a friend of mine, uh, a Brian Smith, not killed in any enemy action, but killed in the canteen fire. He was looking after the canteen, and apparently um, a 50-gallon um, drum of petrol, which had been feeding a space eater, had rolled down the hill and set the uh, marquee on fire, which killed him. Um, he'd been a good friend of mine uh, who I'd met and uh, when we first joined the regiment he'd come along he wasn't National Service he was an old soldier as he'd fought with the Chindits in Burma but we made friends and uh, it saddened me and often I think about uh, Smith in Korea and nothing else happened in Korea really upset went back to observing, going into reserve, although during the last three months of Korea activities did um, hot up there. It seemed as though the infantry uh, were being attacked more. And of course that involved the tanks doing a lot of support firing and that. I think nobody uh, was sorry to leave Korea Although some very bad stories had come back to the regiment about the place we were about to go, Egypt. Um, we sailed from um, Korea, Pusan once again, um, in the uh, HMS Hallidale. And after a journey once again visiting those ports that I mentioned previously, we arrived back at uh, Suez. At this time, I, I'd got my Lance Corporal rank back. In fact, I'd been given the, the rank back uh, of Lance Corporal in Korea. Egypt itself um, looked terrible when you got there. Vast expanse of sand, a huge camp, barbed wire, and no, very few permanent buildings. The main accommodation for the troops in, in the squadron lines was tents um, with the odd Nissan hut. In fact, we had one Nissan hut in, um, in B Squadron, the squadron that I was still with. I was still a radio... Uh, a, a radio operator and most of our time there was engaged with guard and security duties um, we had to take our turns at manning um, two tanks on the Suez Road uh, that was formed as a, a roadblock so that cars belonged to the local population had to slow down and be searched. Now we were given the opportunity to go home from Shandor on leave, but the only thing about it was you had to pay your own way, which was, I think it was £52. But anyway, it was £50 at least, and this you had to save. And on a Lance Corporal's wage in those days, which I cannot recall how much I used to get, uh, it was difficult, but I did do it and found myself going home on leave. I'm very pleased that I went home on leave because that's where I met my wife. And uh, she wrote to me when I went back to Egypt. Ready? In the, in the latter stages of Shandor, I was once again sent to Bobbington on a longer radio course and I was promoted to full corporal. With the regiment then moved to Catrick where we became a 
training re regiment for uh, recruits and national service for the for the army. Um, I was on the radio wing where I was a radio instructor where we instructed in uh, the 19 set which was the standard radio in those days for um, armoured vehicles. Um, the, we used to train the um, uh, people and then they would sit a test and if they passed that test they would then be sent to their various armoured regiments. In Catrick, another um, important thing in my life happened. My eldest son, Rodney, was born. The training of the um, recruits uh, was very fulfilling in that they seemed interested, genuinely interested, um, in learning how to operate that radio set. And they especially enjoyed when we went out. Um, we had like a wooden turret mounted on the back of a one-ton vehicle in which the operator and the uh, radio was. And we motored around the countryside, well, mainly Yorkshire, um, playing at tank um, squadrons and it gave me as a instructor a great deal of satisfaction when I saw these people going forward sitting the trade tests passing the trade test and then going on um, to their regiments during that time they decided to promote me to sergeant and this time um, they also decided to send me on an NBC course, a nuclear, biological and chemical instructors course um, down near Porton where the, um, they carry out experiments with nerve gas and all that sort of uh, stuff for, for mass killing. Um, I did well on the instructor's course and got an A grade in, uh, which resulted in later on they wanted me to go and instruct at that uh, particular school. But at the time I was doing other things in the regiment, um, so I didn't take that opportunity and I stayed with the regiment. Um, we were at Catrick for two years, and after those two years, we moved to Senelager in Germany, B-A-O-R, where my first job was the signal sergeant of A Squadron. What, while I'd been at Catrick, I hadn't mentioned this, this, I had the wife with me, and we were living in married quarters. Um, we lived in Waitworth Road. I think it was number 15. The accommodation would be considered quite primitive today in that um, you didn't have a cooker. You had a fire where you, which you stoked up and had a little over on the side. I, I think they, a ray burn or something they like, like that. You also had a boiler uh, that you stoked um, with coal. Um, there was no um, luxury really in those buildings, although they were dry, they were warm, and it was somewhere to live um, with your wife. I remember though when the wife went in um, to hospital to have my son, she went in on the Sunday, the joint was there, the following day I decided to do myself a piece of meat. So I cut a slice off and put the frying pan on top of this stove um, and then lowered the piece of meat into the oil or fat and put the ends of my fingers into the fat also, <laughs> which caused me to yell out and the next door neighbour to come rushing in. 
Um, but they, when I think of those quarters, they they were adequate, and I did uh, encounter another one later on in my army life, which I'll probably mention as I go through it, that I thought was worse. Um, leaving Catrick, the regiment was sent to the British Army of the Rhine, Semelaga, Athlone Barracks. There I was signal sergeant uh, for A Squadron. My wife uh, and son uh, were, were still with me. And we moved into uh, accommodation in Ringstrasse, um, Senelaga. The houses and that were were better than we'd had at Catrick, uh, being equipped with uh, uh, proper cookers and that, and not having to put your um, stuff on a uh, on a stove. Or, an, or a coal-fired stove. During my time at Senelaga, most of it was occupied with exercising, uh, maintenance of the vehicles. During that time, I was put in charge of uh, second troop as the troop leader. I think at the time the regiment was short of young commissioned officers. During that time, in 1959, I won the uh, inter-troop competition as second troop leader. One thing that I'd bring away from BAOR Germany was that during my time there, the regiment had a visit of cadets from the RAF Cranwell. This was in 1959. And each squadron had to put something on to um, interest them. The squadron that I was in, and I was in A squadron at that time, decided to reenact the damning of, or the, the, the bombing of the Monazi Dam, famously known Dam Busters. I was chosen, and I don't know how I got chosen, as the navigator bomb aimer. Uh, I was going to fly in a little two-seater aircraft from an airfield near Soest, which is close to the Mona Dam. I went there to get briefing, what we were going to do and that, and met the Canadian pilot. Um... And the day prior to going uh, a bomb in the dam, we toured the villages and that in the area, trying to see if we could pick up anything um, who'd been there or any people who'd been there on the night <coughs> the dam was bombed. Uh, we did meet one person. The burgomaster of one of the villages said that he had been a guard on the towers the night of the the damn busters. After staying by the uh, side of the lake overnight, I went to the airfield at Soest. Rest of the troop went to re rejoin the squadron or rejoin the people who came down with the Cranwell cadets who stood on the middle of the Mona Dam between the towers watching to see what would happen. I took off with the uh, Canadian pilot. Um, I told him that I wanted to skim low over the water and aim between the towers. This he did for me. We skimmed over the thing as low as we could, straight between the towers, when uh, someone from the party below let off a thunder flash to simulate the explosion of the bombing of the dam. My recollections of it was the way my stomach met the met my throat as it went over the dam. The air that was coming up the face of the dam lifted up the small, like an express lift. Um, <laughs> I will never forget, never forget that experience. 
After we'd bombed it once, we turned round, went back to Soast, and then I came back to um, the squadron. The Cranwell cadets seemed on the whole to really enjoy that experience of watching us do it and we tried to reenact it as uh, near as we could to what happened that the only exception would be we didn't fly at night and we didn't come in and drop a thing that skipped over the water to hit the dam. The next stage of my uh, army career was at the Junior Leaders Regiment at Bobbington where I'd been posted from the 5th Royal Enlisted Dragoon Guards uh, as NCIC tanks. I was accompanied with my wife and my son. My job at the Junior Leaders Regiment was to look after four Centurion tanks and instruct or show um, the Junior Leaders um, how to drive them. They drove the tanks around the Bovington Heath um, I would also show them the different parts of the engine that needed maintained. In fact, a general familiarisation with with the tanks. During that time, I was sent to um, the Royal Tournament with a Conqueror tank, which we parked in the front of Earl's Court. Um, here we allowed members of the public to come and overlook that vehicle. We had steps at the front and rear of it so they could climb up and down and along the tank. Uh, my vivid re recollection of that was a load of children coming there who were suffering with asthma. Some were terrible asthma and they were a terrible sight and I felt very sorry for them. Another job that I was given while I was at the Junior Leaders Regiment was go to the Royal Tournament Horse of the Year show where the Junior Leaders were providing the arena party. The arena party puts up the courses for the various riders to tackle and also puts up the fences as they're knocked down during the jumping. This was a very interesting job, uh, quite difficult though, watching what the junior leaders were doing as there were many breweries showing there at the same time uh, and they brought all their beer with them and they seemed to enjoy giving that out to members of the public, uh, which included my junior leaders, so I had to keep a careful eye on what they were doing. The third job that I was given away from looking after the tanks, which I'd been sent for initially, was to do a nuclear trial. They had decided to put a tank crew into a tank and lock them in for 24 hours. They had to eat, toilet and everything while in that tank. Also, to fire a complete complement of ammunition. The, the tank crew was made up of junior leaders, the senior junior leaders, just about ready to go to their regiments. And we motored round the Bombington Heath, uh, first of all locked down just to see what it was like. The gunner was sick, travelling in his seat with his eye glued to the site. Um, but otherwise we had no problems till the night. The night we set off again, once again everything was closed down. We were forbidden to uh, open those hatches, whatever happened. I suppose if there had been a big fire, we would have ignored that and got out. But you were being watched at all the time by um, various people as to what was happening inside the tank and... Um, how the tank was operating. I was the commander, and as the commander, they fitted under my chest kind of pads with wires from them. 
I never realised what they were doing with them. I, I think it must have been checking my heart or my breathing or something. And they also hung strange things from the roof of the vehicle, which um, they took readings off. We motored off that night and immediately dropped in a whacking grade hole and the rear sprocket, which drives the tank, broke. We were not allowed out the tank. They came to us with a... The Remy came to us with a, an ARV and pulled us out of the hole, took the track off and put a new sprocket on and off we went. The following morning we had to motor to the range at Lulworth and to do that you had to use the road uh, that, that goes to Wareham near Bovington. Uh, I think they probably used in that uh, a custom in that area to tanks motoring around because we just motored along, we were closed down, I was peering out of my um, scopes to see <laughs> where we were. I was very, very worried, especially on the way there was a petrol station on the left hand side of the road and when we thundered by that every day I thought to myself I hope that we're far enough over in the road because the driver of a Centurion tank has very very limited um, view of what's happening through his periscopes. We would get to um, Lulworth onto the range there where we'd be allowed to fire all these shots we could just pick out any target and fire at them the ammunition was then thrown out um, they pushed a kind of a temperature rod in the people who were watching us I suppose to see what the temperature was like in the turret after you'd been firing and to see what the fumes were like when that was completed, we used a motor off. Well, we, we motored off that day back to the Bombington Heath where they allowed us to open up. We opened up the turret and we thought that was the end of it. We'd done our 24 hours when they started to bring ammunition again and once again we had to load the vehicle up and then suddenly somebody said, Flash! which meant a nuclear explosion. We had to close down and repeat the, 20, the previous 24 hours, except that we didn't drop in a hole that night. We managed to keep um, clear of that. The only things I found difficult about it inside there was people going to the toilet. With urination it was easy because we kept some of the shell cases back from the firing and you could urinate in them. And they, they were leak proof. They didn't leak anywhere. Doing the other thing, which people would normally do in the toilet, was more difficult. And the way we overcome it, and I think only one of the crew used it, was the we suspended an old seat we'd got on the cleaning rods of the 20-pounder and hung it underneath on hooks, a plastic bag in which... The crew member did what he'd got to do. That was folded up then and then passed out to the people who were monitoring us. I, I'm told that they weighed it, but I don't know. Um, after another 24 hours, we were taken back to Bobbington again and the trials were over and we were released. Well, from, from Bobbington I moved back to Tidworth where the regiment was stationed and I was a troop sergeant for Mr Phipps later to become Major General Courage uh, 1st Troop C Squadron. <coughs> it was during this time that I was asked to train the Gurkhas who were also stationed at Tidworth in the .30 Brownie machine gun, which was mounted on their ferret armoured cars. I did this partly 
through speaking to him in English and partly through a uh, interpreter, which I had. I found these men very, very keen to learn. But what I was told, when you're teaching Gurkhas, you must always teach them the correct thing. If you teach them something incorrectly, they will remember that and, in fact, make the same mistakes as you did. So um, I had to be careful the way I instructed them. The culmination of this training, which was done in classrooms, was taking them down to Lulworth to fire uh, their guns. That was accomplished by quite a long trip from Tidworth to Lulworth and back again. We came back the same day um, and the convoy uh, of about six cars motoring along those roads uh, needed a lot of watching but the Gurkhas were very very good. I was very very pleased to instruct them and what they did for me was I had bought a cookery from an antique shop years and years ago. They showed me how they sharpened and used it in war. Um, after that, I went back to the first troop and I was sent for by the commanding officer who said he was promoting me to staff sergeant and I was to take over the position of provost in the regiment. He apparently was quite concerned with some of the discipline and he told me he wanted it tightening up. Um, this I did. Uh, I kept on in the provost staff for, I think it was probably about six months, when I was told that I was being moved to the officer's mess, this time as the officer's mess um, staff sergeant. Running an officer's mess it's a bit like running a high-class hotel where you're involved in wines and messing for the officers. You also uh, have to handle any problems that they might bring to you um, about how the, the mess is running. During that time, I went over to Inniskilling and was escort to the standard which was um, being laid up. Um, King Leopold, who was colonel of the regiment, uh, accepted the standard. I then went back to um, running the, the officer's mess and the, the regiment then moved to Aden and Bahrain. I packed up the officers' mess in Tidworth. It was an unaccompanied tour we were going on, so I had to find accommodation for the wife and uh, two children by that time, as I had another a son. Um, and I found them a place um, where they could stay whilst I was doing my year in Aden. Um, they didn't stay there the whole time. In fact, uh, she went back. Uh, my wife went back to her mother with the two children until I came back <coughs> from Aden. I opened the officer's mess up in um, Aden. I packed it up in Tidworth and I... started to run the officer's mess as we'd run it in England. My only problem I had was with the Somali waiters which worked for me. They, when I wanted to start serving meals at night and that, they were praying. They all got their prayer mats out and started praying. I said to the chief boy we had there, why do you always start praying when I'm about to serve meals. 
and organised the officer's mess. He said to me, We are praying for you to be a sergeant major. This shortly came afterwards. I was promoted to WO2 and became the sergeant major of B Squadron, which um, I will enlarge upon uh, as we go along. Um, we were a squadron shortly to go to Bahrain um, on the tank landing ship Stryker as the sergeant major and I'd never done it before I, I was responsible for the unloading and loading of the tanks in the uh, in the Persian Gulf what the what, am I, what HMS Stryker would do and the tanks were always on board was to motor around the Persian Gulf, I think really showing the flag. We would visit places like Kuwait. We would land on some of the islands and carry out uh, small exercises and firing. Um, and it was during this landing and uh, then getting back on board again uh, it was my responsibility. And you stood on a huge ramp in front of the ship and guided the tanks onto the ramp and then got out of the way as quick as you could while they motored on. The only difficulty you had was the ramp went up and down in the water and you often found yourself up to your, above your knees in water as the weight of the tank pushed the, moved the ship down. The only mistake I made there was on my first landing or put it, getting back on board. I forget, forgot one of the tanks to put it back on. It was a, a Royal Engineers tank that had been adapted to work in deep water so that if any of our centurions had got stuck, it could motor up to them and pull them out. I'd forgot completely about this tank. I loaded the um, two troops into the striker and then went to my bed. Uh, next thing I know, Sergeant Stewart came to me and said, you forgot a tank. <laughs> so we had to unshackle <laughs> the tanks and move them up to get this one back on again. I never forgot that again. <laughs> um... Bahrain itself as a station, uh, the accommodation was, was split up, the officer's mess, sergeant's mess and the actual camp were, were all in different locations. It's quite a nice place, the accommodation was, was good um, and you knew that you were there for six months and during that time you did quite a lot with the, with the Navy. Um, in fact, the people on the striker became great friends um, and would do anything for you. During that time, I also tried a lot of fishing, um, especially while I was still back in Aden when we tried shark fishing, but to no avail. We caught lots of other little fish from a little Arab boat that we'd... Uh, Hired, uh, but no sharks. Although um, one of the chaps in the boat had got a big hook on the end of a uh, clothesline with a huge piece of meat he'd got from the cookhouse, reckoned that a shark had taken it as he was jerked from one end of the boat to the other. I still think to this day he caught it on a rock. <laughs> The time in Aden and Bahrain really passed quite quickly after a um, a year there. Um, Bahrain was, was much better than the Aden part of it. The Aden part, the security was was high, uh, and there was always a chance of um, somebody trying to bomb you or blow you up. 
Um, so security, you had to be alert all the time. And though the co accommodation was good there, it was, um, you know, all air conditioned. The only problem was a lot of bed bugs, which we stopped go climbing up the beds by putting tins of diesel um, where you stood the leg in the tin and filled it with diesel to stop them crawling up the bed. Um, this was especially rife in the squadron office when you did duty NCO. Um, <laughs> no, I think I missed out. I think that's wrong. I think that was... Well, following Aden and Bahrain, we moved to Benghazi. Firstly, we went back to England on leave and collected our families and uh, moved to Benghazi where I was in uh, married quarters in Wavell Barracks. The life in Benghazi was really... By this time we changed and we were an air portable squadron with um, ferret scout cars. Um, we did exercises with them. With them you could go a fair way into the desert and we did a lot of these um, long range desert um, exercises. We also had to learn to um, operate by sun compass which um, everybody took to. Um, the thing with a sun compass, you have to believe what it is telling you. If you start to think uh, something else and do not follow what you're seeing on the sun compass, you will soon become helplessly lost in the desert. One thing that happened to me while I was in Benghazi, well, was associated with Benghazi, was the regiment decided to send me on a helicopter handlers course at Old Sarum. Um, I went to Benina, which is the airport in Benghazi, and I found that there was a dust storm blowing and no planes were being allowed to land there. They were overflowing Benina. So I trundled back to the camp in Wavell Barracks again and I was walking up the road when Colonel Woods saw me and said, I thought you were going on a course. And I said, I was, Colonel, but there are no flights. Um, they're not flying there to Benina. He said, hang on a moment. He went into his office came out and said, go back down there, a plane will be calling in to collect you. Uh, so I went back down to Benina, stood there, and out of the dust storm came a World War II bomber, which stopped. Pilot got out with his leather hat on and his goggles, came across to me, said, are you Sergeant Major Clips? And I said, yes. He said, come on, I'll take you to Malta. So I jumped into this plane. I sat in a kind of a strap seat in the in the plane itself. To this day, I'm still not certain whether it was a Lancaster or Wellington bomber. Apparently, it had been touring round, doing demonstrations at various places, and it was going to Malta. Um, it took me to Malta. Well, when I got to Malta, I went to see the RAF representatives there. They said, there is a VC-10 leaving um, you can get on that. It's only got spare parts on it. So I jumped on this VC-10 and went and landed at Bryce Norton from where I went on the helicopter handling course. Once that had been completed, obviously I went back to the regiment in Benghazi and uh, carried on with the air portable squadron. During that time, the day of the birthday parade there, the Queen's birthday parade, the, a war broke out. They call it the Six Day War. It was when the Israelis attacked Egypt and 
all the countries along North African coast um, rioted and that was the same in Benghazi. They rioted in the town threatening to um, kill the American consul, burn out the consulate and of course there could have been harm done to the families. So they started a big family evacuation, bringing as many families as they could back to the camp and they sent in um, riot squads but um, an armoured regiment is not equipped for riots so we had to practice that um, dustbin lids and um, pick, pick elf, staves of pick elves um, and riot squads were sent by the reg regiment down into into Benghazi to try and help with the situation there, mainly to get out the Americans and the families. The um, myself, I was sent to the the guard room with the RSM to make sure that the dissidents did not break into the camp. Um, the only incident that we had down there was the fact that two lorries turned up full of Arabs, were armed with sticks and various weapons but they were only shouting at us and when they realised we had got um, sterling machine guns and that they scarped and we didn't see any more. There were however um, members of the regiment hurt in Benghazi, in particular Colonel Taylor who was um, burnt very very badly. The tour finished in Benghazi. I moved with the wife uh, to Wheaton Camp, where in the first instance I was a sergeant major, and we uh, had a, some very, a very nice quarter there, but they decided that I needed to move to the other side of the road into a bungalow, because the bungalows were for warrant officers class two. This I did. Shortly after that, I was commissioned and as a lieutenant I had to move again. So this was the third quarter in about six months. I moved down there with a the wife and became um, a, a lieutenant. Commissioned. At the same time I also received my long service and good conduct medal. Uh, which uh, was very fulfilling for me. As a commission officer, um, I found it quite difficult initially in that your friends who had been in the Sergeant Smiths with you the day before had to, the following day, salute you and call you sir. Um, this uh, was quite difficult and you... Well, you worry about it. You worry about your friends being no longer friendly with you. There's been a change of circumstances. You're now one of the bosses, one of the elite, supposedly elite, in the officer's mess. Shortly after I was commissioned to um, lieutenant, I was MTO, they made me a mechanical transport officer. I was sent on a follow-up of a Cape tour. And I motored round um, Northern Ireland, visiting various addresses and that, and with a display that we used to set up in the towns, trying to get more recruits to join the regiment. During that time I stayed with the, with an old um, regimental secretary, uh, Major Robson. He was very, very kind to me. But he asked me if I would help him organise a cocktail party in Carrickfergus Castle. This I did. I helped him and we ran the cocktail party that, that night. Shortly afterwards... Um, 
Major Robson asked me if I would bring a photo, uh, a picture of King William crossing the Boyne back to England and to do it um, secretly. Um, the reason being that the members of the IRA had threatened to burn down Carrick Fergus Castle if this picture was not removed. I brought it back to England in the back of my Land Rover, wrapped in sacking, and I think probably it's hanging in the officer's mess at the moment. Um, once that had finished, in I went back to Wheaton, and the regiment was ready then to move back to BAR again. You, you want me to go straight to Monster, do you? When, when this was? No, the, in Hereford we went first. Right, yeah, I'm just yeah. asking, when was it? 19, yeah, in 1969 right. we went back to Hereford. Um, that's again when I thought to, my, I thought to myself, why have I accepted a commission in that I couldn't get a quarter because the points as a lieutenant, I had not got enough points. Um, as a sergeant major, I'd had no problem. I would have walked straight into a married quarter. But here, um, as, a, as a lieutenant, I didn't have sufficient quarters. So we hired a flat in the middle of Hereford. That was nice. It was a nice flat and overlooked the centre of Hereford. Shortly after that, the um, a colonel, Padre, who was living on his own, asked me if myself and the wife and children wanted to move in with him, which we did uh, until a quarter became available when we moved to Munster. As the MTO in Hereford, I found myself involved quite a lot in the passing of a matrix test where um, dependents of the um, soldiers out there have to learn the theory um, of driving on the German roads. Uh, I became a very powerful, popular character <laughs> when they used to come and sit this test. Um, Hereford passed very, very quickly and in 1970 we then went to um, Monster. By this time, I had been promoted to captain. I was still the um, MTO. During that time, uh, one thing happened to me, which is worth mentioning. That we, the squadrons were carrying out exercises up in the Hona Salter area again, and I was asked to judge the refuelling of tanks at night. <clears throat> the squadrons went out, formed up in leaguers, waiting to be re refuelled. I went out with the refuelling um, vehicles, and I was riding on the back of a stalwart that was loaded with fuel, sitting in the centre of it. Uh, the reason I was doing that was that I felt that from that position I could see better what was going on rather than sit in the front of the stalwart with the driver. Um, we went out. There was no lights allowed. We were drive, completely driving in the dark. Um, I heard the driver changing down to the, get the stalwart to the top of this slope. Um, stalwarts had been designed to go anywhere where a tank could go. Six-wheel drive, very powerful vehicles. But suddenly I felt the vehicle slipping, going sideways, and I realised it was going to overturn. Uh, I had to make a decision very quickly. In fact, the decision was made for me. As I stood up, thinking, shall I jump away from the stalwart, away from the direction it was rolling? It tipped so quickly that I had no other choice 
than to jump with it. And I jumped and I landed on a kind of slope the other side. I started to scrabble up there and I heard the stalwart sliding back down towards me and the cans, full cans of, of petrol started to fall about me and some of them fell on my right ankle. Uh, fortunately the stalwart stopped and uh, I was taken in the back of a stalwart on a sheet to the hospital, the local German hospital, where they put my ankle and that in plaster. Um, so that was my stalwart adventure. By this time I was a captain in uh, as the MTO. Shortly after um, I got, I would <laughs> give another job. Um, the regiment by then was equipped with chieftains and I was sent to be second in command of C Squadron with Major Faulkner, Bobby Faulkner. Um, after familiar myself with the chieftain, we um, started doing exercises and I became very familiar with the chieftain and uh, during that time the brigadier decided that the squadron leader uh, of C squadron would be killed and the squadron and the rest of the combat team would be taken over by uh, the captain who happened to be me. Uh, when that came over the radio it was a shock. Anyway, I recovered, pulled the combat team together and we carried on and at the end of it uh, the brigadier seemed quite happy with what I'd done. I then moved again, this time to L Squadron where they made me uh, major. I, um, it was a new squadron uh, that had been formed from the old HQ squadron. It was a large squadron and obviously it was responsible for MT, the supply of the vehicles, uh, the Sabre squadrons, supply of transport to the major, uh, Sabre squadrons and the servicing. We looked after servicing bay which serviced the vehicles, the, the, the tanks in the regiment. Um, this job I carried on until I went with the regiment to Cyprus, to Polymedia, where we acted in an uh, infantry um, situation. I uh, was based at Polymedia as the Hell Squadron leader. Um, I was also made football officer, which uh, resulted in me having to bring the football team back from uh, Cyprus to play in the Cavalry Cup. Um, unfortunately, we didn't succeed, and I went back to um, Cyprus again. After we'd done the six months in Cyprus, we then went back to Munster, um, where I was the major commanding L squadron and we carried back on with supply replenishment taking part in exercises <coughs> from Munster. It was during this t trial, uh, during this time we were back at Hona again carrying out annual firing and doing um, exercises on what they called the Lunenberger Heide. Um, it's like a big heath in the Salter area, which is used for tank training. <coughs> and once again, Hona, and they were asking for volunteers, this time not for people to volunteer to go anywhere, but volunteers to drive a Centurion manned target tank. 
This is the first time it had ever been done in the British Army of the Rhine. And they were looking for somebody who'd had experience of driving centurions, which I had, so I volunteered. At the same time as I volunteered, Lieutenant Edmondson, who had also come up the same route as me to a commission, said he would command me. And we made up the crew. The tank was being fired at by swing fire rockets by a, the guided weapon troop of the regiment who was shortly due to go to America for to, to represent the British Army there. We were issued with instructions. We also attended briefings by the RAC staff at Hona who looked after the ranges, what we would do. We went to see the tank, which had been up armoured. Um, it was officially going to be called Tango 55 on the radio. We decided to nickname it Rubber Ducky, because we hope it, that the things would bounce off us. I will say at this time that the explosive heads of the rockets had been removed and they'd been replaced by inert heads that would not explode. The, the weapons, or the people from the, the ranges, were quite concerned. This is the first time this had been done. They didn't know where, what would happen, but they were really worried about fire, and precautions were taken um, with up-arming of the petrol tanks, and the exhausts, um, extra fire extinguishers put, were put on board, and uh, there was a standby ambulance on the firing point. The day came when we took it out. We took it from the, the barracks out onto the ranges, where once again we received a briefing brief to make sure we were OK. We were shown the area where we had to drive the tank backwards and forwards. It was about 2,000 yards from the point where the guided missiles were. We were told to close down. Uh, we were, the radio net was checked to make sure that we were on net. We could hear the, um, also hear the um, guided weapons troop talking. We were all on the same net. We started, I was driving along um, with Ian Edmondson in the turret and I thought to myself when I made the first run up, up the length of the, the, the area we were allowed to run along that they'd missed us because I hadn't felt anything hit us until I came to the end of the run when there was this terrific bang and it felt as though it had jerked the tank sideways. And that was their first shot hitting the front bazooka plate of the tank. I turned round and we went back down the other way. And there was another bang and another one hit the side of the turret. At which time um, Lieutenant Edmondson said from the turret, Brian, I think there's paint coming off. <laughs> oh, I said, don't worry, you're OK. He said, yes. So we carried on. There was only one time when we noticed on the, 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 that the tank was getting very, very hot and we thought it was overheating, so we had to stop. But it proved to be OK and we carried on firing. Um, and at the end of the trial, we'd been hit several times Guided Weapons Troop was obviously pleased about what they had done. The range staff was pleased to get their tank back in one piece. And after the trial, we were interviewed by a couple of reporters who took our photographs, which appeared in the, uh, uh, the newspaper they issued in Germany as the first for the skins again. Um, when we got out of the tank and looked at it, we could see where the um, missiles had struck us, but no damage. That's it. Following um, the spell I spent in Munster, 
Uh, I was then given the job of Camp Commandant in Cyprus. This was at the headquarters of the United Nations Force in, in Cyprus. And I was responsible there for a huge camp, the largest camp that I've ever been involved in. And to help me do that, I, the setup there was just like a regimental headquarters with adjutant, RSM, quartermaster, chief clerk, and other staff as well. Um, it, was, it was quite enjoyable. Um, I was also made PMC of the officer's mess, which was a mess used by several different nationalities that made up the United Nations. Um, there was a great social life as these countries um, seem to hold lots of parties when they are abroad uh, and I was always invited, uh, which was very good. The only thing is, because the Turkish troops had invaded Cyprus the time before, they would evacuated the quarters and there was... You, you could not take your wife there, or you were warned not to take your wife um, because of uh, um, further activities by the by the Turkish army. Um, luckily at that time, we'd bought our own bungalow and uh, the wife went to live in that while I went on this year's tour uh, as camp commandant. During that time, um, I helped in the move of the Turkish population uh, from uh, in south to the north of the island. It, it had been agreed by the Turkish and uh, Greek Cypriot leader that Turks who wanted to could move to the north and take over the houses and that that had been vacated by the Greek population when the island had been invaded. My job in that was uh, at the camp was a point where they did a changeover. It was a dispersal point where they did a changeover between the transport, which was Greek transport and Turkish transport. We also flew helicopters from there, bringing in old people or people who were sick and inf infirmed. Uh, at the dispersal point, I had to provide sandwiches and cold water or a cold drink for the drivers, not the people who were being moved. And I had to check a manifest to make sure they were, they were all who they said they were. This was done, obviously, with an interpreter. I could speak no Turkish. Um, the Turkish... Interpreter was called Ziggy, and I was always taking the mickey out of him. And the one thing I said to him, Ziggy, I've done this for you now. I've helped you move all these people, and there was over eight thousand, and we've moved them over a period of a month. I said, I shall expect an invitation to a good meal, and he laughed. Anyway, shortly after that. I Probably a couple of months after that, I received a, a written invitation from the Minister of the Turkish Republic of Cyprus, inviting me to a meal in a restaurant in the Turkish old quarter of Nicosia. Um, I had to get permission to go there, but I can tell you, it was some party. Shortly after that, I moved. I, I finished my. Um, tour uh, with the United Nations and came came back to uh, the, the regiment which was by this time was in Catrick again um, preparing to move to Osnabrück um, I was uh, HQ squadron the name had now changed from <coughs> L squadron back to HQ squadron although basically it was a, the same with just a few changes um, in what were in the different squadrons. 
after being there probably a couple of months, I I thought to myself, I'm back on the old um, treadmill again. I'm going to have L Squadron, HQ Squadron, back in Germany again. Do I really want to do that? Uh, I decided to give Civilian Street a try, and I resigned my commission. And shortly afterwards, um, I did a few resettlement courses. I came out of the army in uh, 1976 and became a civilian where I started work uh, with Starlow Barrett Shoes as their warehouse manager. My time in the army, I don't regret Oh, I regret very little of it. Most of it was good. It was challenging. I was pleased with the way I'd progressed through the army, although I still find it difficult to understand how someone with no education, other than what he'd learnt in the army, had moved from trooper to major in a the most famous cavalry regiment in the British Army. Well, that's what I thought anyway. The only down times in it were when my wife and I had to be separated. I don't mean for the short periods uh, of exercise and that, but the long periods, such as when I went to Aden um, and when I went to Cyprus. There were certain jobs I didn't like while I was in the army. At one time I was a football officer. Um, I'd never liked football really, although we um, we played some good games. Uh, but I still today um, don't watch football on the telly because um, of this uh, not liking football. I've been made to do it in the army. The it gives me a great deal of pride to think that I'd um, been successful and I had commanded these different squadron. If I was asked um, today whether I would join the army again, I would. Um, there's probably things I'd like to do better because I'd like to become a major general, but that might have been a bit too uh, far away from my reach. But I would tell any young person who was thinking about joining the services to join it and enjoy yourself. Just stick your nose to the grindstone, do as you're told, and you will get on in life. Thank you very much, Mr. Pickerson. Thank you.